Yes. So okay. I've. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll leave it over to you, and I'll I'll be off, and I'll come back on about just after eight. Okay. Okay, Carl. Take care. Oh, here's and hands on now. Bye. 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 Um, Bye. So I, I decided to do 10 B. Obviously, this is a place of focus for my dissertation, but I think there's more to 10 B than just that. I used to uh, go as a little girl. Um, it was a place that me and my family would always go to. So it was a very special place. And it's, I think it's very beautiful. Um, I'm very interested for the history and the archaeology that's going around in the area um, and I think we'll only scratch the surface tonight because there's so many fantastic things um, but I've brought forward my favourite things to talk about um, Tenby and why I think this is an important area. Obviously I will be bringing up the uh, Tudor Merchant House for a bit but that's because I just love the place um, and it, it's one thing that I fell in love with when I was a child so um to be honest, when you look at all of this, I think you've got to be very, uh, it's, it's quite hard to actually analyse an area and try and find something new to uh, discuss if you read up on the historical literature beforehand. Sometimes people can put their own opinions into your heads and it's hard to actually go and see what's going on in the archaeology without that. So um, I know looking through my dissertation, one thing that I was always looking at was documentary um, evidence and the archaeology, but I would do, do it in a sort of little tier system in a way. I'd start off with the archaeology and then I'd work my way down to uh, documentary evidence and then historical literature. I just didn't want the archaeology to be uh, full of assumptions based on things that I had read beforehand. And... I will say, on a whole, I think Tenby is so interesting when you have a look at it. I know there's a settlement nearby um, Tenby, which has a lot of um, Mediterranean glass and a lot of um, rich evidence to suggest a strong, uh, stable economy through trade with um, European and Mediterranean um, regions as well. But I think the one thing I thought was quite interesting was how it's changed. It does change a little bit through his trade, but it's still a strong, stable economy. And you can still see how this is definitely um, a main spot for trade. And I think as you go towards West Wales, you start to see more influence from um, our Irish neighbours. When you go more towards West, I think you see start to have some uh, links and connections more with the English neighbour. So we, you, you kind of see how both sides really do affect Wales in some sort of way. And just looking at articles that you can see online, there's a, one, it, one in um, current archaeology that talks about um, Welsh society and how it grew and how it developed in the later medieval period um, and how you can look for characteristics in the archaeology to actually pinpoint trade and how it works and functions in these areas. So um, I think th there is definitely a reason as to why um, I think the Normans thought Wales was quite important to actually attack. And I think it is places like Tenby and Cardiff and Newport that we see the strong evidence of uh, trade. But I think when you see these thriving coastal towns like Tenby, you start to see how these trading links are, are coming up in a range of pieces of evidence. It's not just one thing. And I think when you put them all together, it's interesting. It's almost like putting pieces to a puzzle or breadcrumbs to tell you what the whole bigger picture was. And I, I just love looking at it because it's just lots of little um, nitty gritty bits that's all around Tenby that really tells some fantastic stories. And I think when you look at Tenby, for example, in this article by uh, Ian Salisbury, um, he talks about um, the diversity in Tenby and Cardiff um, and even Carmarthen and Chepstow, you see how these the diversity of these areas allowed them to grow in population, which is a strong evidence of this trade. And you see how these are uh, these uh, little local market centres for Wales, but also attract places from uh, people from all sorts of places. And we'll be looking at that. But I think a lot of people are in, they're not very satisfied with the archaeological evidence. I think, especially when you get to um, areas such as Tenby, it is quite fragmented, but it, you've just got to delve deeper. You've got to be really creative in how you look at all this. Um, 
So this is documentary evidence that I found on that fantastic website. Um, again, it's my favourite website. It, I, you can see the reference on the side. Um, the website is Medieval and Tudor Ships. Um, if you just type that in on Google, you come up with all of this. Like I said, there's a map, you can interact with it. And um, for example, I clicked on Tembi as a port. And this is all the... Uh, references to Tembi through trade, through many manuscripts um, and where the ships have come from. So you can start to make links. And this was the second part of my research was looking at something like this. And it's, it's quite frustrating. I wish we had earlier evidence, but at the same time, I think it's, pardon me, I think it's fantastic to look at. Um, you can see the references on the side. So if you do go on the website, on the homepage, they tell you where each one comes from. Um, the majority of the earlier ones are from the uh, National Archives online. And you can actually look at all the evidence that is discussed here um, just by using the uh, code in the source reference. Um, and I think it's fantastic because what we're seeing in the archaeology is, I feel like, is reflecting this documentary evidence. It's showing us that this documentary evidence is telling us some truth. I think the one reason why I get iffy about documentary evidence is that it you can't solely depend on something like this because it will be fragmented it you might have manuscripts missing that could tell you a completely different story and more evidence so um yeah this is why I went for this secondly um but the earliest evidence that I can see here um is 14 um 09 I believe one thing I hate about this uh, website as well is how it doesn't put things in chronological order you have to really look deep um, but yes, 1409, and this is coming from France. Um, and one thing I thought was quite interesting was when I was looking at the same period um, in Milford Haven, which is not far off uh, this area, um, Milford Haven was having the same sort of trade. And I do think this is a strong evidence of wine trade with France and how we have got this strong connection. And I do believe is direct trade um, as well. And that, what I was looking at is how you see that um French uh, vessels would go to Ireland and it's almost like they were taking a route and Wales was a perfect South Wales was in a perfect area for them to stop off at different points and also trade more um allowing them to um have more goods and more um more, more wealth from that but also Wales could as well so I think they're benefiting from this link of France to Irish, uh, Irish Sea and Ireland all the way down to Bristol but Wales was perfectly in the middle there and I think that's because there's a lot of things in South Wales that was attracting um, these French vessels and um, there's pottery being made um, all over South Wales and you have evidence of that um, Alice Forward is um, someone who done a paper that you can read online and is looking at the ceramic evidence uh, from the later medieval period right up to the 17th century and she's always noting lots of pottery that's coming from South Wales um, and how it was clearly some of them were for everyday purposes and some of them were almost like to uh, show off their fancy designs. And so she, she, she's arguing that this was basically a thriving place. Wales was not backwards and that Wales did have the facilities to actually have good craftsmanship and pottery. And I do think this is why we're seeing a lot of connections with places outside of Britain. But when you do have a look, you definitely see how um, there's other places that you would expect um, for example, you see Bristol there um, right up into the 1500s. I generally think that there's a, a lot of evidence uh, uh, through the archaeology that would suggest um, earlier trades with Bristol. Um, but that's what the documentary evidence is saying. Um, and you even see trade with Milford Haven as well, um, which I would also uh, expect that as well just because they're close to each other. It would be a very good connection. It's a very thriving area, um, and you do find that. And I was, I was having a look at all my evidence, really, and I think the one place that was really frustrating me was Ross Silly, um, and I ended up connecting Ross Silly to a, a castle nearby that had a lot of evidence with agriculture and how that was being traded. But when I look at the documentary evidence of this place here, there seems to be a completely different feel. There seems to be more evidence um, without there being much material 
um, evidence as well, if that makes sense. We'll still <coughs> talk about that and I'll expand, expand further. <coughs> but you definitely see how when we get to the 13th to 14th century, there, there is a, a rise in population. I think there is a sharing of ideas. Um, people uh, are expanding with their industry and expanding um through uh, the expanding their influences, so it's putting that into their identity. And I think this is why we're starting to see Wales starting to thrive and really um, grow strong because of this period as well. Um, and I think the growth in local markets is seen with places like Tenby is the reason for that as well. Um, but just looking at um, the, the documentary evidence, you do definitely see how, for example, um, E. A. Lewis, he talks about the development of industry in Wales, and he even just talks about how this all started with um, just before the Romans, when it was seven estuary to, to England and even down to Ireland as well. But the, it really started to boom with the uh, Roman period, and it stayed. And you definitely see how there's a po this pointing towards um, fisheries actually being in Tenby as well. And if you have a look on um, Arquilio, even though it's quite outdated, there's still um, evidence of uh, medieval fish traps that are found um, by the, the coast in Tenby as well, which would suggest that this was also traded in fish. So I, I wanted to actually look at what this would look like, because sometimes when you have a look on Google Maps, it can just really be quite frustrating if if you're looking at how I was. I was having a little bit of a blip the other day and I really couldn't sort of figure out the town of how it used to be. And then as soon as I saw a photo like this, it just snapped back. I knew what I was doing then. But you can definitely see how this is really well placed. Um, and the reason why I say that is that they can't be starved out. So if it, people were going to invade from land, they can't be starved out because they have these great connections based off of the trade they're doing from the coast. And that because of that, they'll never ever be hungry. And I think uh, one thing that's quite interesting is that the castle um, is quite far away from the, the walls. Um, and that's definitely because the castle's the most important thing is an administrative center as well for the rest of the town. And it holds the economy and the importance of the area. And so it would be more easy to keep that further away from the walls. Um, and keep it closer to the sea. Um, but this is a fantastic image that you can look at. Um, definitely, it, I, the place hasn't still lost its beauty because it's still beautiful now. Um, always love going there. And I know uh, one thing that's going to be of interest that we'll talk about based on an excavation is this little church here. Oh, that's a rubbish colour. Um, get that one there. It's that lovely church there. Um, we'll be talking about that further as well. Um, but you definitely see how there's a, a lot of defence going on here. I think it's definitely a symbol of trying to say um, very strong city as well, very stable, um, really giving out that, that propaganda in the way that this town looks like. Um, and you can definitely see where the gates are as well. Um, there's gates all over the place. Obviously, there's going to be a gate by here for anyone coming in from the sea. Um, you've got the, the, the castle over here as well, and you've obviously got another gate by here for anyone coming in, it's just to regulate it all, obviously. And then you have um, a lot of these um, these uh, towers. This is just to look out for defence. Um, and I also think it's another way of just uh, it, it is showing off your wealth and strength as well. I think this is the main purpose of a lot of these places. But I think it's really interesting how it was planned. You always see things like this. Um, being planned much differently but I like the plan of Tembi um, and I think it just adds to his beauty really and I think the caves as well I um, used to go and explore in the caves as a child and then as I got older I learned that the caves had told us so much about our history as well so um, this is it the castle is further away like I said for it to be protected but you can see how this is a thriving city um, and definitely um, one of importance as well and we definitely see the importance as it goes into the Tudor period um which we'll we'll further discuss my laptop wants to move that so um this is one of the uh towers that I used to uh see a lot when I was a child um used to walk there and I actually do get a funny feeling looking at this because I uh always remember it being quite warm because my family would be going at a very warm 
sunny day and looking at this thinking wow this is absolutely fantastic and it just gives this lovely feel um to the whole area really and um, to see all of this but I know um a lot of people will just walk by, past this without even thinking but I used to little me used to walk for there I used to stand in the middle in of that tower and just look up and just think wow this is really tall and it would be quite intimidating you wouldn't want to attack this because um you wouldn't stand a chance really um but I just love how the history of this town is just there for everyone to actually experience in their everyday uh life um and we will oh I think I, that was meant to be later but we'll discuss it now so obviously there's um a lot of attention based on uh, Tembe um, and his trade. Um, like I said, this is a very important area. Um, there's a lot of discussion about um, what had gone on and how this was an important area for Henry the uh, Seventh. And this talks about how Henry the Seventh would escape um, through tunnels, and this was recently being uh, sold, actually, and um, what I could read in the news. But if I just quickly go back a minute, if my laptop would work, and um, just go back to this a minute before I uh, actually jump ahead to that. So um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about this. There's a lot of discussion about um, the the area of um, Tempe really starting to uh, pick up was um, in the early medieval period um, with Norse influence. Um, and I, like I said, there's a settlement nearby um, that would have traded here that had a lot of Mediterranean influence as well for their archaeology. Um, but there's also an early reference to a settlement at Tembe, and it's a poem um, from the 9th century uh, preserved in the 4th, 14th century book of Tylerson as well. And I think that's just absolutely fantastic because we're actually backing it up. It's so rich with the history and the archaeology that's coming out of this. But Tempe was taken by the Normans. I think the Normans saw this as an important place strategically and they were correct. Um, and this is when you see this fortification, which is always a sign of trade in my eyes. Um, but this was in the early 12th century when the Normans would invaded West Wales. Um, and it this is uh, this fortification that was being created um, to actually, again, I think is this Norman um, influence of how strong they were. They were working with stone again, which the Anglo-Saxons tried. But it was just much easier to work with wood, whereas stone, it's just making a much more stronger um, message. And we do see some Welsh princes actually creating castles in stone as well. And they're definitely fantastic and one to be admired. Um, and we definitely see how this town has seen a lot of uh, Welsh revolts in the time of the Normans trying to uh, invade and take over. Um, and you definitely see how the Welsh didn't give up without a fight here. Um, and in 1457, so the uncle of Henry Tudor, Jasper Tudor, he agreed to share with the town's merchants the cost of refurbishing and improving Tempe's uh, defences because of his economic importance in this part of Wales and I think that the fact that everyone was happy to join in on that well I don't what I've read doesn't really say how they felt about it but I think it would benefit them that there would be more defences it would benefit them to actually ensure that this town was improved because it allows their trade to be uh, thriving more and I think it sends out of a message as well that they're um a perfect place to trade with um, and definitely bring in the interest of other people. Um, and like I said, it is, it's important for the economy of Wales as well. So it was in their best interest to protect it. And you see how um, these turret towers were added at the ends of walls. They were um, put onto cliff edges. Um, they really, really went hard with protecting the site and with this fortification. Um, but when you get to the later medieval uh, periods as well, Tembe is awarded royal grants uh, to finance and, main, uh, of, and finance the maintenance and, and improvements of his defences and the enclosure of the harbour. So again, they're having more money pumped into this. I think this is just evidence of a very important place. Um, you see that these traders come from Bristol, from Ireland, um, from France, Spain, Portugal. Um, there was exports of wool and skins and canvas and coal. Um, 
coal and iron and even oil as well. Um, and in 1566, it was recorded that Portuguese seamen actually landed the first oranges in Wales from Tembe. Um, and in this period, you can see how this town was bustling full of people. It was busy. It was important. You have all these different types of trade. Um, you start to see as time goes on, spices are coming here now. And it, you can definitely see how this was um, a place that was uh, very important to Wales. Um, very, very important. And when you get to the Wars of the Roses, Henry Tudor, the future King Henry VII, of England, he shouted at Tenby um, before sailing to uh, exile in 1471. And we will talk about that when we get to this part here. So um, you can see that they've got the blue plaque here, which is by the Tenby Civic Society. And it's, they've put this blue plaque up and it says that Henry Tudor, later King Henry VII, escaped through a tunnel here in 1471, when um when he fled to France. And you can see where they've pointed the arrows, how it would all go down, how you'd end up at the bottom uh, based on that. And I think it just adds to his uh, magic, really. I think, I, I don't know about you guys, but I always get a feeling when I look at places and you see these stories of people fleeing in these secret tunnels, it just adds to the magic, um, adds to this mystical sort of feel to it. Um, and that's one thing that's been of interest for a lot of people in the news as well, because a lot of people have been seeing this um, qu quite recently. They were going to sell it, but um, I'll have a quick talk about it. So um, this used to be a current boot site, the uh, shop where you get all the uh, shampoos and the medicines on the high streets, chemist. Um, it, it hid this dark tunnel that was once a legend uh, that has it that this future king fled. And I think that's the one thing I love about this is how you can ha see how the archaeology is always interacting with uh, time as it still goes on. Um, present day is still interacting with these tunnels and these tunnels are also interacting with every other period that is uh, encountered as well. Um, it's a relationship with each other. Um, it, it's all mixed up. Um, time because it, it still is in use but for different things. So this is a, a very famous tunnel that's underneath the uh, Tudor Square and it, it was thought to have played a key role in British history by helping Henry VII escape from his enemies. So when he was 14 years old, Henry Tudor was hidden below the bustling Pembrokeshire town street um, before he fled to Brittany. And it's thought they escaped via the cellars under the Mayor Thomas White House in the high street where this boots chemist um, stands. But the underground uh, tunnel runs in one direction and it's towards the harbour because the harbour is where you can get out safely um, without being caught and just sail away and off you go. Um, and he said that he went to... Um, the harbour got into one of Thomas White's boats and just went. Um, and he returned 14 years later to defeat Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 and claim the crown. Um, the tunnel uh, is now, um, it is, it is uh, explored by a very uh, small series that's in Welsh, it's Dan Bach o Hanes, which is, uh, it translates to um, a small piece of history. Um, and the presenter who looks at this, he looks at the network of these medieval tunnels and what lies underneath these Georgian buildings of this historical seaside town. And he says, apart from the Norman walls and the castle that were built to keep out Welsh forces, the only medieval buildings left that are striking Tudor House, which is now the Museum of the National Trust, the Tudor Merchant House, and the ancient St. Mary's Church. But he's saying that although we only have these buildings left, the underground has been left untouched. And this is when you see these fascinating tunnels, which can hold so much legend and story. Um, a local historian helped him. Um, his name is John um, Bainan. Um, he's uh, 
he, he was talking about these networks of tunnels and helped with the fact that this was property of the mayor, the local merchant, and the ship owner, Thomas White, and how they all worked together. Um, and he's seen how this was important to stock wine and coal and other luxurious items that would have uh, been seen at this harbour. But it's all, all of these network tunnels that are under the city, they all lead to the harbour. Um, and it, it said that Henry Tudor and his uncle Jasper Tudor hid there from the soldiers of the then English king Richard III. Um, but the only issue is, is that it's a legend. It's, it's, there's no documentary evidence to back this up at this moment in time. But it seems to be one that's quite favoured. Um, there is a, a discussion how um, this first started. It's thought that Queen Elizabeth, in her reign, this is when the rumour first started that King Henry VII was actually hiding here. So this is where it all started. And it was then written up in a biography of Henry VII, um, written by an author who had known him. Um, but again, it didn't seem like it was very credible. It seemed like it was something they had heard. Um, but looking at the rich history, the Tenby Civic Society feels like it should still be celebrated because it attracts so many tourists. It's beautiful, it's magical. Um, so like I said, they put a plaque up there um, so you can show off um, this fa fantastic piece of history to visitors. Um, and I think that's why you like what I like with these busy towns is that they still hold on to their past. So... Um, they, 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 this is one thing that I think is absolutely fantastic is how important um, this site is and how you can still see how fantastic those tunnels are. They look absolutely fantastic, even though they're quite hidden. Um, and it just makes you think what they would have seen as well. You can definitely see where all of that is. The boots is on the top and then the, um, the secret tunnels that lead out is at the bottom. So if I uh, click on to the next one. So this one uh, was a, a fantastic thing to read about. Um, the excavations outside St. Mary's Church. <clears throat> this was done by George Williams with um, help of um, a D. Brenham. They looked at this site um, in 1999, but there was a, a lot of discussions of it in 1966 and how important this churchyard was for in archaeological interest. And they basically surrounded their, um, their investigation based on um, a, a sub the church within a substantial structure that is probably remains of a porch, which had caused a considerable amount of problems of the interpretation um, in the relationship to the documentary evidence. So I think, again, he's, he's trying to... Uh, see what's going on um, and definitely one thing that I noted was that this excavation um, they, they, I think they read too much about the history first but they've done a great job here and um, they had a trial excavation and then they started to find more and more um, evidence such as um, a half um, a lot of tiles here um, a white mortar floor um, a second phase wall as well as a first phase wall um, and definitely this was sort of pointing away from the church. Um, so, so as you, uh, from the west side of the church, it was sticking diagonally out. And I think this is what was really confusing, was trying to find out what this was and what it was trying to show us. So when they had the observations uh, two years prior, they started to find that there was a, a lot of... Uh, uh, structures actually being found around the site and so they had to have a quick salvage um, excavation and this actually encouraged then uh, more research to actually uh, take hold. So the, the, the time and the area that they had available for excavating was quite limited which is a shame um, but I still think that even though it was a small quantity of archaeological evidence um, it still tells us a lot of evidence. So um, the, the, when they had a look at this, they could definitely see that there was some pottery being found. Um, small pieces of pottery, but pottery, and I think it definitely shows there's um, occupation here and obviously a, a great deal of wealth as well. Um, they did find a lot of uh, North Devon uh, gravel-tempered uh, fabric, 
Lake, which um, I found a bit of at St Mary's Beach, um, which would have been dated around well, the 17th um, to the 18th century. Um, but they started to find more evidence as well. Um, a lot of uh, Dev- North Devon uh, pottery from the 17th to the 18th century. Um, but they'd also find in um, a lot of slipways as well as coming from uh, Bristol from the 17th century as well. Um, but the evidence was also telling us a lot more as well. Um, they were talking about how there's this um, finding of some ham green pottery, but a very small amount of it as well. Um, and to personally, again, this is very good um, thing for trade. Um, and personally, would I would suggest this has um, got links to Bristol as well. Um, there's also um, a lot of discussion about the floor tiles as well. Um, there was five fragments of this ridge tile that was uh, recovered, um, and it was this gravel temple tempered fabric, um, which was made quite locally, actually. And they think that this originated from uh, Carmarthen Greyfriars area. And um, what they could see was that the pattern was uh, also contemporary to the time of the 15th to 16th century. Um, but they were able to find more, um, a, a lot of locally made tiles from Carmarthen was coming up here. And again, it's suggesting a lot of local trades as well. Um, but they were able to further find more information about um, how this was clearly an area that does have a lot of history and archaeology just underneath people's feet and people didn't even know about it. Um, and I think that's one frustrating thing. I think this is the same frustration I have with Cardiff. Um, a lot of my discussions around Cardiff is that we know something's going on here. There have been a small amount of excavations in the sea centre, but the majority of it is sealed over. And I think that's the uh, depressing thing about things like this is that it's underneath all the concrete and it just hurts to think, oh, they'll never see the light of day. Um, which is a shame, but again, a beautiful church. Um, that image that I showed you, there was a recreation. It has that there as well. Um, so you can definitely start to have an idea of what's going on in this area. I wanted to bring to something that I have talked about in the past, um, but not a lot. And I think further suggests the fashion and the influence of identity of people uh, moving to a place like Tembe and the population growing. Um, I think the way you look if, throughout time has been a way of uh, identifying yourself. Um, and this was definitely a big thing as well. You definitely see people out there that some of them look like goths or emos and some, some of them look quite funky in the way they look. That's who their identity is, who they uh, relate to, uh, what they relate to. And we definitely see something like this in the medieval period. Um, so there was metal detectorists um, walking about, um, doing what metal detectorists do and scanning floor. Um, and it was this year, so it was in October 2021, um, that there was two stunning medieval brooches found near Tembe. And you can imagine the excitement when you had to uh, give this over for not wanting to actually give it over. And from what I could see, so if I can get my pen, ooh, from what I can see here is that it's, it's almost like there's a decoration that's been rubbed off as well. Um, it just looks like there's small amount of it. Obviously, there's decoration here as well, um, and it's worn away a bit there. Um, in the other brooch, the uh, pin in the middle, this part was uh, missing. But this best example of it and this is 800 years old um this is an absolutely fantastic find um and it's now with the uh, national museum of wales <clears throat> um and it the metal detectorist that was uh, involved in finding this his name was david johnston he was with someone else when they had gone um so the these brooches were made out of silver and they were dug up in spring 2019 but it was only reve- revealed to us in October 2021 and they, they're now saying that the price of the item that these two individuals can split that um, but it was found in a grazing field that wasn't so far from the area um, and they believe that 
they that this was very important so they actually gave it to um someone who had worked for the Tenby Museum to have a look and that's when they found that this was a silver medieval brooch it's a lovely little brooch and you can definitely see how they would have uh, worn this with uh, a, a sort of shawl sort of thing that pin it together. Um, and they think that this is absolutely fantastic because it's not just telling us about identity, it's not just telling us about um, the, the design, because I think it's also telling us how um, there's some fantastic uh, metalworking going on in Wales and maybe something that Wales also benefited from, from trade as well. Um, but it builds a picture of fashion in the medieval period, this piece of jewellery. Um, these two brooches is thought to be worn um, during the bubonic plague and the swept through Europe. Um, and Dr Red, Mark Redknapp, an archaeologist, um, medieval archaeologist in the National Museum of Wales, he talks about how these are that these were very popular across medieval Wales. And it's a very small um, example of how clothing would have been made out of, uh, uh, it's a small example that may have uh, fastened clothing together um, with a fine cloth. So obviously having something over you, draping it over and just pin it together. Um, and there's only, uh, there's about 20 to 45 um, treasure cases that are reported in Wales each year. Um, a lot of them are found by metal detectorists, but when the metal detectorists work with the archaeologists, they allow um, archaeologists to expand on their knowledge and their interpretation of the area. <clears throat> so I think that was really um, good to see. <clears throat> um, and and I, I liked seeing that in the news. Um, to me, it was it just felt quite relatable. <coughs> um, I can see myself in the medieval period, possibly with a load of brooches on, just showing off. Really, I do like a little bit of uh, anything sparkly. I'm like a magpie. Um, so if we go to the next one now, um, also this was something else that was found by metal detectorists. Um, it seems like this area is very rich for finding things. So if I get my notes to work, if they want to, aha. Um, so metal, it was um, six metal detectorists that had come together and brought their finds together. Um, and these were dating in uh, age from around about 800 BC to the 16th century as well, which has uh, been declared uh, treasure by the HM coroner of, uh, for Carmarthenshire and Pembrokeshire. Um, but this shows how there's a, a lot of hordes that were going on in the area, and this is one of the hordes that they had found. So um, these are the hordes that were found near Tenby. Um, a horde of 105 Roman coins found um, near Tenby. Um, you see that there was a fragmentary silver arm ring found um, nearby. There was a, a medieval silver seal matrix as well, which is got found uh, near um, a church. And one thing that I thought was quite interesting about that is how um, when I was doing my manuscript studies, we would talk about seals of uh, manuscripts and how the more um, precious they were in metal, the more likely they were going to be stolen. So there's very rare examples of uh, medieval manuscripts of their gold seal. Um, and it's even fantastic that they found a silver seal, really, um, through uh, metal detector. And um, because you, they, they're still being found and you can clearly see that someone possibly had taken that or maybe even lost it because they're quite heavy on a bit of parchment. They also found a 16th century uh, decorative gilt ring as well. Um, and they even found a post-medieval silver um, ring as well. Um, but this, this was absolutely fantastic. These are the, uh, some of the Roman coins that they had found there um, in this hoard. And I think they're quite well preserved because um, you can still kind of see. Um, obviously, you can get better preserved ones. It's absolutely fantastic. It just makes you think of the hands that would have held this as well. Um, and a lot of people are suggesting how this is important. Dr. Mark Redknapp, he always jumps into this. He talks about how um, this is an important area throughout time. It wasn't the medieval period. It was also beforehand as well. And how um, the Vikings really helped as long, along with the Romans to actually kickstart the importance of this area. So I thought it was just quite interesting and just something to actually look at um, and see how Tenby is really bringing forward a lot of uh, finds that we can admire and appreciate today. 
so um, we get to my other favourite thing of when I used to go there as a child, and I love how you can still see it in the, the structure. Um, it's, it's very cute, it's quite hidden, but when you find it, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and this is a 15th century townhouse um, in Tembe. And it was it was made from stone, as you can see, it, it was very important. It was very it was part of a commercial port that was very busy, it was bustling full of people. And so the person living in this house, they would have had they would have had a lot of trade and goods that was brought into and out of the uh, town's harbour. Um, and they would have definitely been someone that was really enjoying the rewards of trading at Tembe. Um, there is three stories to this building. And what I love is that when you go in there, they've recreated uh, how some of it would have looked. And you definitely see how this was a, a fantastic house to live in. Um, and you see the beautiful oak beams and the beautiful wall painting that they're still um, uh, looking after um, now. But it's beautiful. You can see little roses on there. It's gorgeous. Um, the first floor would have been um, accessed by an external uh, staircase um, and then you have toilet facilities that would have been located in a, a tower on the side of the house. And you, you could definitely see how this would have been um, also a status for that individual to live in because this is such a big um, property um, especially in a very busy town. But from what we know of documentary evidence of um, the links that it has with royalty and the medieval politics of the time, you see how this is a very important area and you can see the need of wanting to show off your wealth because you're making, um, a, you make, sending out a message just like the rest of the city is um, and I just love the fact that that was one of the first places to actually experience oranges um, to Britain as well just think it just adds to it why it's so special to us um, but you definitely see how um, in 1650 so uh, this was really experiencing the heyday of the trade incentive, but when it got to 1650, you definitely see how there was a second plague outbreak, which killed half of the town's remaining population. And so there was a, a bit of a, a economic decline, um, which is something that you would see, but um, a lot of the business class left. And this did result into the town decaying and going to ruin. But when you get to the 18th century, you definitely see how after John Weasley has noted that two thirds of the old town is in ruins or vanished completely and that animals are just roaming free, um, it starts to pick up um, and you definitely see how um, it, this builds back up again. Um, a lot of people then start having uh, evidence being brought forward. So when you have a look at blogs online, when you get to the 1800s, you definitely see how there's this slowly uh, it, slowly they're trying to improve the area and definitely has worked um, but it's just you see how um, plagues really do bring down um, the, the, the end to some places really but if it was strong the first place it'll always be strong and it'll come back fighting and kicking um, so I think Tenby is a fantastic place you're learning more about the domestic um, lives of those who enjoyed the trade um, you're learning more about what the religious community was getting from this with the church and the uh the fantastic bits of pottery that's coming out of this and we definitely see how there's a lot of economic and arch architectural archaeology as well that can tell you a story as to why there was a lot going on here and a lot of legends and a lot of kings um coming here as well we definitely see how this is a place that's thriving it really is a testament to ea lewis's um article about the development of industry in South Wales and how it really booms and that's something that you see with uh, William Rees. William Rees talks about how administrative uh, administrative uh, uh, structures um, shows how there's a growth and an, a growth in importance and population of the area um, and you definitely see how they're good indicators for trade. Um, but you definitely see how there's a lot of trade links with Britain and beyond and how you see that there's um, an importance to this area even to this day because of how beautiful um, the archaeology is 
archaeology is and how there's so many legends that can really pull people in um, so they can enjoy it. So uh, one thing I think is quite interesting is having a look on the Portable Antiquities scheme online because they do show you some of the uh, finds found by metal detectorists and again it just adds to why it can be so fantastic and unique. So that is something that I would say have a little gander at if you have spare time and um, because sometimes it's just nice to look at that. Um, so I'll stop sharing and I'll uh, ask if there's any questions. Uh, Pat, is there anything that you'd like to uh, ask or add? Oh, hang on, Pat, I think you mute. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I was going to ask who owns it, but I found out National Trust does. And it yeah. doesn't open again until March or something. They're, they're March yeah. Something like that, yeah. I've never been there and I've always wanted to go. So uh, six pounds is quite reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's lovely. And I think it, it they really do bring to life what it would have looked like. And they have a bit of what it would have been like for the children that lived there. And there's also, they show you what sort of... Uh, items of trade would be stored on the first floor and um even the, looking at the wall paintings is absolutely fantastic um i think it that going around about march and onwards is the best time because you can experience the the weather's always lovely there i've never gone there and the weather's awful um probably because i go at the right time of year but it's beautiful when you go there and i know that there's um where there's a pub on the way down to the uh the beach um, and we always used to go there in the evening as family and I know that that's um, an old Tudor late medieval uh, square that you can all sit around and it's quite small and cute but it's actually nice to experience and have um, some, a nice meal there really. Um, I do recommend it Pat, it's lovely yeah. um, there I as well. I have a friend who doesn't walk far is there any way I can maybe drop her off nearby and then go park or something? Yeah, there's a um, car park right outside the uh, city walls from what I could remember um, because a lot of people flood there. So I think they uh, obviously want to draw tourists in. So they uh, put as many uh, uh, car parks as they can there to attract people and make sure they're accessible as well. Yeah. No, but that, that, that'd be nice if you can go there, Pat. You'll have to let us know about your trip and how it went as well. Okay, will do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anne, anything that you'd like to ask or add? No. I, um, I actually uh, lived for a week in Crackwell Street in Tenby, oh, which is Ooh. one of the three-storey houses quite near the, the merchant's house. And I don't know how we got it. It was one of the girls from school... But we were all 17 and we've got, you know, <laughs> we've finished our A-level, uh, you know, mock A-levels. And we all went down to this uh, wow. house and it was fantastic, you know, it was, uh, it was a fantastic holiday. But, um, yeah, I, I think what you, I'd call Tenby a fine town, you know, it was a fine town. Like, yeah. You know, uh, and it is nice to talk about it because it, it's, um, you know, it, everything's focused, isn't it, on on uh, the south and and these large towns, um, Norfolk or you know, all the big sort of <coughs> cities. But these fine small towns were really the the um, they were the first port of call, weren't they? But, yeah, but, you know they, they were the first sort of significant towns, really, on on the Welsh um, coast. You know, and uh, I think I think they they've got a lot of history. Yeah, a lot of history <clears throat> to tell us. But I wouldn't sort of mix up like early. Uh, yeah, I mean early medieval. Uh, I keep thinking about the early medieval, but. Um, that was mainly sort of the churches, wasn't it? You know, and the and the monasteries, and then all the people who sort of not monasteries, but the churches, and then people would be farming really in the early mm. medieval, I suppose. But this shows it was it was a pro prosperous town and Halford West, Halford West and Milford mm. Haven, all those, you know. Um, you don't realise how medieval they, they were, you know. Yeah. And, 
more so than like Newport, you know, which which was really wasn't very big at all. Mm, I, I I think I think one thing is with the uh, later medieval periods is that these towns really surprise you um, mm. because I and I think it is down to the the lack of attention to the history um just everywhere we walk but when you just even scratch the surface you see these like Newport and Cardiff and uh, Tembe they, they tell you a story and they're screaming at you for you to acknowledge how these were thriving towns in the later medieval period and they really uh, done Wales proud I think with uh, how well it actually planned out yeah yeah <laughs> thank you Anne um, and Richard anything that you would like to ask or add yeah no I'll just say it is a lovely town yeah, the it's first beautiful. time I went down was when I was 17. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Two years ago. Oh, <laughs> I know. It was, it was you so, know, it was, we, um, you know, every so few romantic. Years, yeah, every few years, we, you know, we go down there. So we had a few holidays there when the kids were yeah. young, you know. Yeah. We stayed in Picton Avenue, I think, or Picton Street, like in a little boarding house there the one year. And, yeah. Mm. caravans you know sort of outside tembe mm. um, it's definitely a beautiful place um, it is, some, I, I, you know lovely yeah. places around there you know and cut yeah it's just yeah. if you say a lot of it mine was all you know used to call it little england it doesn't yeah. sound welsh though does it it seems it seems like you know french or you know it's, it's modeled on yeah. like french uh yeah, really, like you know, wasn't it? Saint Michel. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like that. Yeah, yeah you it's definitely get it. And some lovely places around it, you know, Saint Florence, and mm. yeah. I think that was all. I think there were potteries and that there. Yeah, the mm. Flemish. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely fantastic. I think, I think that's what frustrates me when you think that. That when you read these uh, articles about there being more pottery being made from uh, England and then you start to look into it and think, yeah, there's potteries near Tenby. Um, and I think for a place like that that's thriving, I think they are going to actually try and make a name for themselves through pottery as well. Um, it would be mad not to. Um, it, it, they clearly like to show off with lots of things, um, especially oranges being the first to do be documented to come there, which shows that they've got these great trade links. So it'd just be crazy that to, to suggest that um, they wouldn't be making their own pottery, but definitely a fantastic place and definitely one to actually go and explore. Um, I do urge that for anyone who's watching as well live. Um, but thank you everyone for today and thank you Richard and Pat and Anne and I'll see you next week. Um, okay. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye then. Tomorrow. Nice to see you tomorrow, Anne. Bye. 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 I did ask Carl about. Do you want to turn the. Um, here. Oh, you're here, are you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Did, did you hear that I I got charged £115 for Zoom? And what? I've been charged £115 for Zoom. What the hell? You, I, I, I don't get what you mean. Well, I don't either because it's it's supposed to be free, isn't it? It is supposed to be free. Oh, and you, my, oh my credit. No, you, you're right. You need to get over to them. This is ridiculous. You shouldn't be paying for Zoom. Yeah, I, I've, um, I have, you know, gone to the credit card people and told them that I, I didn't recognise it at all. And, and she said, probably what's happened is somewhere along the line, I joined Zoom myself and yeah. I, I bought a, a more expensive package, uh, package yeah. and oh, I didn't well present it, you know. So I, I, I'm in trouble, but never mind. I'll just have to, they did say they'd investigate it, you know. But um, and don't pay any money, they said. Yeah, and because I think I'm not, I'm not getting any anything from it, you know, mm. whatever. Because all I'm doing is getting your Zoom <coughs> meeting. Is it a Zoom meeting? Or is it yeah, and um, and I think they'll uh, quickly uh, close that down because um, you only pay a package if you because you if you're being a host, 
you, for free, you get 20 minutes for free. And then if you want any more, you have to uh, pay. Um, but I think they'll have evidence that you haven't been hosting meetings. And so yeah. it would be easily sorted. I wouldn't worry yeah. too much about it. It's just frustrating because I've had incidents where I've clicked a button and I've had money come out yeah, of my account they, and I'm confused. They, you know, they should send you like a, a notification to say, mm. you know, well, welcome to such and such. You know, we've we've updated your, you know, and, and they don't. No, they, they don't. do it, you know. But um, the trouble is now I've gone and downloaded, I've just gone and uninstalled the Zoom that I had before. And now they're not going to be able to see what what, I, what I've what done on it. So, yes, they will. Mm. Yes, they will. Yeah, yeah, they're connected with your card that was paid with it. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that card was just on my Facebook account. Mm. So you see, because I've signed in on for Facebook on Facebook, and they've used all my credit, you know, all my details to to sort of charge me an account, you know. But anyway, it's not Carl. It's nothing to do with Carl. I know that. But so I'm I'm Here's just dealing with it. But Carl's but, actually taken out the uh, Zoom and uh, his name in your bank account details on. Joking, yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's happening now? Are we going to cancel Friday or just go ahead? I don't know, it's, it's, it's under shelter. I don't know what the problem is. And, oh. and the other thing, the other thing as well, is I got the van. So, if it's a worst case scenario, we'll all jump in the back of the van on the seats. All right, okay. uh, mind you, it's, it's blue, weird light, and Jessica knows what I'm on about. Yeah, it's, it's a party bus. Oh. <laughs> Oh well, I'll um. Well, Pat and I are going to dress up warm anyway, you know, in just in case. Well, it might be cold, but uh, anyway, good night then. God bless. Good night, Anne. I'm going to be honest with you. You've booked on an event in December. Of course, it's going to be bloody cold. I know. <laughs> I know. But I'm doing it for Pat. <laughs> oh well, well, I, I, I flip an egg. Yeah, exactly. You know, I did think it was a good idea, but then I thought, oh, I don't really want to get cold. But um, she said I can sit in her car if I want. <laughs> oh. Well, then, I'll see you tomorrow, Jess. Good night, Anne. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. It's, oh, it's, it, it's only thee and me. <laughs> oh, right, we got stuff. We got, we got, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching on uh, YouTube, and uh, thank you very much. And... We'll, we'll end that and uh, don't forget to like, um, subscribe and say how wonderful